Hi everyone! In this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at the pulse oximeter, one of our five ASA monitors, to understand how it works, pearls and pitfalls, factors that alter its reading, and how to determine if it's giving us accurate information. So first and foremost, how does this piece of equipment work? So, as you can see here, I have a crude drawing of a finger and a pulse ox on top and underneath of it. Now, on one side of the pulse ox, there is the light emission source, which I'll draw here in blue, or the light emitting diode. And we're going to draw two of them because we're going to talk about two different wavelengths that are being emitted. And on the other end, there are two light detection sources for those diodes to direct their light towards. These are also indicated in blue. Light is then emitted from the emission source through the finger towards the sensor at the opposite side at two different wavelengths. One is a red light here, which is the red light that we see of the pulse ox, and that emits light at 660 nanometers. The other light is an infrared light emitted here in purple, and that is at 940 nanometers. Now, the light at 660 nanometers interacts with and is absorbed by deoxygenated hemoglobin or hemoglobin without an oxygen molecule attached to it, while the other 940 nanometer wavelength interacts with and is absorbed by oxygenated hemoglobin or hemoglobin that has an oxygen molecule attached. What this means is that when a patient has a lot of oxygenated hemoglobin in their blood, not a lot of light at the 940 nanometer wavelength will make it through to its sensor because most of it is being absorbed by oxygenated hemoglobin in the blood. Conversely, in that same patient, a lot of the 660 nanometer light will make it across here, I apologize, here, because there's not a lot of deoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood to absorb that wavelength. So it gets through. The computer then takes the ratio of the amount of light at the two wavelengths that reaches the detector and compares them. It then uses that ratio as well as a lookup table to determine the percent of oxygenation of an individual. Now, there are a lot of non-clinical physics details regarding Beer's law and the attenuation of light and its interaction with the materials that it passes through in regards to the pulse ox, but that is beyond the scope of this lecture and is not, as I mentioned earlier, clinically significant. Now note, the way that the machine works is that it is dependent on pulsatile flow, hence the name pulse oximeter. And it's important because it's this feature of the machine that allows it to differentiate between arterial blood oxygen concentration or saturation and venous blood oxygen saturation, as venous blood is not pulsatile. So again, remember, pulsatile flow, very important for this concept, and you'll see why in a minute. So now that we've established how the basic concept of how the device works, we need to know if the readings we're getting from it are in fact accurate and how and what factors may affect it. So we're going to take a look at the most common things you'll see, not just in the operating room, but perioperatively, that may contribute to inaccurate readings. And we'll make this factors affecting pulse ox. So for starters, anything that alters blood flow through the area in which the monitor is placed can give you a bad reading. Again, we mentioned that it's dependent on pulsatile flow, so if you cut off that flow, you'll mess up the reading. So interruptions... in flow. This may come in the form of the blood pressure cuff inflating as it will cut off blood flow to the finger in this case resulting in a bad or non-existent pulse ox reading and it's also why it's common practice to place the blood pressure cuff on the opposite arm or somewhere else than the pulse ox monitor. Hypothermia or just having cold fingers or wherever the pulse ox is will lead to peripheral vasoconstriction in which case you can have blood shunted away from wherever you have the monitor 
which can lead to poor readings as well. And you'll see patients who have cold fingers, you won't get as good readings on. Patients with peripheral arterial disease, such as smokers and diabetics, may also have poor pulse ox readings as the vasculature is mostly destroyed and as a result have poor blood flow. The take-home message is that anything that compromises blood flow to wherever the sensor is can give you an inaccurate pulse ox reading and it should be taken into consideration when evaluating a patient. Two, times in which blood flow is non-pulsatile. Comes non-pulsatile can affect your pulse oximeter for the same reason that the flow is non-pulsatile. This can include patients on ECMO who don't have a beating heart, patients who are on bypass, or patients with assist devices that force the blood flow to become laminar and non-pulsatile. Again, to emphasize, non-pulsatile flow can give a false reading. Nail polish is something that you'll also come across. Nail polish. This was demonstrated in a study from 1988 by Cote et al. That looked at different colored nail polishes and showed that blue, green, and black led to significantly lower pulse ox readings. Decrease readings. Now, this was supposed to be a function of disruption of light absorption at the detector portion of the pulse ox because the thought was that these colors may absorb some of the light going through. Since then, though, a recent study in 2007 from Rodden et al. at the Medical University of South Carolina demonstrated that a statistically significant decrease with blue nail polish occurs, but it was not clinically significant and was less than or equal to a 1% difference. Nonetheless, it still may come up on tests, and if it does, blue, green, and black nail polishes will be the way to go. Ambient light may also mess with your pulse ox. Ambient light. As on its own, it may interact with the light detection source on the pulse oximeter. Now, modern pulse oximeters have mostly gotten around this, but oftentimes covering the sensor can sometimes improve the true pulse ox reading. A study from 2003 from Fluck et al. demonstrated that with modern commercially available pulse oximeters, there really is no significant difference in readings with or without the presence of ambient light. Certain injected dyes, such as indocyanin green, may also affect your pulse ox reading, through the same concept that the nail polish did in that it changes the absorption of light by the blood. Lastly, hemoglobinopathies, which we won't go through in too much depth in this video as they have a very expansive amount of information to do on their own. But what we should recognize here is that met hemoglobinemia will give a reading of 85% traditionally and that carboxy hemoglobin can give anywhere from 70 to 100 percent but it usually reads 100 percent as the pulse ox can't differentiate between carboxy and oxygenated hemoglobin the final part to touch on while i erase this is the pi or the perfusion index perfusion index, which is an assessment of pulsatile strength at a given site. It's calculated by the computer as a ratio of pulsatile to non-pulsatile blood flow. The numbers can range from 0.02% to 20%, with 0.02% representing a very poor flow state and 20% being a very good flow state. As your PI begins to dip below 1%, your waveform may become distorted and it's possible that your data may be incorrect. So you should always get a baseline before going to sleep. That's all for the basics of the pulse oximeter. If you have any questions or topics you uncovered, please write to us. Otherwise, check back in for the next video.